Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being with us here today. Our session is uh, Breaking Barriers with Universal Design for Learning and Women's History. Um, so as we get started, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and tell us a little bit where you're from, what you teach. I see Katie has already, Kate has already started. Thank you, Kate, for getting us started here. Um, I'm Philippa Rappaport. I'm the lead for education and engagement at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, which is the central education office at the Smithsonian, and we're the office behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Um, my description, I'm a medium-billed woman with graying, curly hair, a wintry blue sweater, and in an office with the last little bits of daylight coming through the window. Uh, I'm joined today by Ashley Corin, who is the head of education at the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative at the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum, and Tess Porter, who is the user experience strategist at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology. And I'll let them introduce themselves, say hello. Hey everyone watching today and later, hope you're doing okay. I'm Ashley Korn, as Philippa mentioned. Um, I am a petite uh, woman with dark brown skin. I've got some cool glasses on right now. Um, and I have virtually no hair. So that's where I'm at today. And hi everyone, my name is Tess. I am a also petite woman with long, uh, dark hair, pale skin, a sweater that matches Philippa's wintry blue one. Mine's a little green. And I'm sitting in front of a blurred background that's hiding a lot of art and an overcrowded bookshelf. <laughs> Thank you both. Oh, sorry, um, I forgot to add what I was wearing. Yeah, yeah, go uh, I'm wearing a gray sweater and I am in a slightly cold apartment and behind me you can see my shade, which is not helping at all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so in our session today, Ashley and Tess will talk about ways to break learning barriers with women's history resources and the universal design for learning framework. Uh, focusing on Mexican-American labor activist Emma Tenayuca, they'll share transferable techniques, visual literacy activities, and digital resources to create inclusive learning experiences for all students. You'll leave our session today with tangible strategies to break barriers in your own classroom. Um, this is a presentation we were able to give at the Smithsonian National Education Summit this past summer, and we're really pleased to be able to bring it to you today. And, and, and that means we can add it to the Cultivating Learning Archive of sessions. So thank you so much for being here, Ashley and Tess. Um, as always with our sessions, we, we really like to interact with you and we welcome your comments and feedback and questions. So please do share anything you want to say. Um, if you're joining us by YouTube, the chat is at the far right of your screen. And if you're joining us by Facebook, the comment section is, whoops, is in the bottom center. I messed up my slides a little, but you get the idea. Um, Please do feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat or continue to. Um, the uh, Smithsonian Learning Lab is a free online platform where you can discover digital museum resources from across the Smithsonian and beyond, create interactive learning experiences with them, and share your discoveries and creations with others. And we'll be sharing resources today from the Smithsonian Learning Lab, and any links that we share can be found in a companion Learning Lab collection, and we'll walk you through that collection later in the program today. A couple of things for our um, in the lab, I, we wanna tell you we have revamped our Help Center page. You can get to that from any page in the Learning Lab by scrolling to the bottom and clicking on Get Started. And this is what it looks like here. You can find step-by-step -step instructions, access to a whole range of videos to help you um, do really anything you want to do in the lab. And if you see the, the link there, webinars and events, if you click there, that will take us to our professional learning page. 
um, professional development webinars and events, and that's where you can access our live sessions and also our archived sessions. A reminder that our session is being recorded today. Um, you can watch the archive at the same link that you're watching from now. And before I turn it over to Tess, I want to start out with a question. So our question is, do you incorporate universal design learning, UDL, in your classroom? And if so, how? And I'll turn it over to Tess. Thank you, Philippa. And um, hi again, everybody. I'll give you um, a few moments to respond to these questions in the chat. Take your time. I think from Ashley, my perspective, we would love to know um, the prior knowledge that you have and also love to see how you, for those of you who do use universal design for learning, the many ways that you incorporate it in your classrooms. And I got to say already, thank you to folks who are responding in the chat. It's really exciting to see the range of places people are joining us from. I'm seeing Michigan and Colorado and California and Virginia. Um, so thank you all for joining. While you share uh, your prior experiences with Universal Design for Learning, um, I'll dive into a quick preview of what we're going to be doing together today. Philip, if you can move to the next slide. On this slide, you'll see a preview of our agenda today. Um, so we're going to be doing a few different things together. To start off with, we'll begin with an introduction to Universal Design for Learning, or as you'll hear Ashley, Philip, and I uh, refer to it throughout as its acronym UDL. After this brief overview to get us all on the same page, Ashley is going to take over with an overview of Latinx women in history, including ideas about bringing perspectives into your classrooms. Then we'll model two different uh, connected activities incorporating UDL and Latinx women's history. The first one focuses on visual analysis and the second focuses on um, a video. We'll talk more about it when we get there. And then we'll close with a really cool opportunity for your students to take action, thinking about Latinx women's history, about universal design and more through a new opportunity from the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. Ashley will share more about that. Um, if you can move to the next slide. Um, through all of this, you'll be able to by the end of the session, implement the Universal Design for Learning framework to identify and break learning barriers in your classroom, use transferable techniques to build students' visual literacy skills, and find and share digital museum resources to engage students with Latinx women's history. Um, so we've got a lot to do together. Uh, so it looks like we've got a couple of responses in the chat thinking about how you use, a, if you use UDL already, if you do, how do you use it? Mark shares, I try to provide students a range of materials to engage with and a choice for how to share their understanding often, but not always with a technology tools and resources. Wonderful. Please keep sharing your uh, ideas and ways if you use it, or if you don't, we'd love to know that too in the chat. Um, to get us all on the same page, I'll start off with this quick introduction to what UDL is. Um, UDL is a framework developed by the CAST organization to improve and optimize teaching and learning for everyone based on the science of how humans learn. Application of UDL by educators in any discipline or domain can ensure all learners can access and participate in meaningful, challenging learning opportunities. The key to this is that UDL focuses on addressing barriers in the learning environment. By minimizing barriers, educators maximize learning. So the UDL guidelines offer a set of concrete suggestions to design learning experiences for your students. I'll go through a brief overview of these guidelines. Um, I've also linked the full guidelines graphic organizer, which this slide displays a blurred preview of in the session description and collection of resources we're gonna be sharing with you after. So the UDO guidelines are organized both vertically and horizontally. On the next slide, uh, you'll see a preview of the vertical organization. Vertically, it's organized according to the three principles of UDL, 
providing multiple means of engagement or the why of learning, representation or the what of learning, and action and expression, also known as the how of learning. On the next slide, you'll see how it's organized horizontally. Here, the guidelines are organized by learner targets to increase access, build effort and persistence, and internalize self-empowerment. At the cross-section of these principles and targets, you'll find concrete suggestions and checkpoints for implementation. Uh, so for example, if you're looking to provide multiple means of engagement while increasing learner access to the content, it might be helpful to check out the suggestions for recruiting interest. On the next slide, uh, you'll see the overall goals of UDL. Uh, together, UDL leads to this goal of developing expert learners who are each in their own way, purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-oriented. The UDL guidelines are not meant to be a prescription, but a set of suggestions that can be applied as needed to reduce barriers and meet certain learning goals. Uh, so throughout today's session, Ashley and I will model using UDL and sharing a little bit behind the scenes of how it influenced our decisions and pulling the activities together. Uh, with that, Ashley, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Tess. Whew. So I'm coming from the Women's History Museum. So the work that me and my team do is that we not only try to share the incredible stories of women and girls in America, because we're an education team, we also try to look for ways to think about pedagogy and how women's history can actually be used as a tool to think about different strategies and methodologies. So for this project, we really decided to focus on Latinx women in history, an incredibly important and rich topic. The Smithsonian is home to an abundance of objects that focus on the history of Latinx women and girls in America. Um, and there are a couple of really amazing objects at the Smithsonian, which we loved, including this poster of Emma Tenayuka on the right hand part of this slide, um, to be able to both share those stories while using a particular framework, in this case, UDL. So as I mentioned on our right, uh, there is a poster, a black and white poster with some gray. Um, the poster has white type, uh, has white font on the cover. And then in the center, we see a woman who is Emma Tenayuka. Um, her face has been um, shaded with different variations of brown and orange. Now we had a presentation earlier this summer at the National Education Summit where we sort of tested out some of the things that we've been working on in terms of this sort of UDL project. Um, and, you know, like I said, the Smithsonian's home to many objects from sculpture to music to um, Ellen Ochoa's uh, flight suit name tag to ofrendas to, I mean, we literally have everything in the collection. But, you know, we had a really great discussion with educators and they reminded us of a couple of things when anyone is thinking about um, showcasing the stories of Latinx women and girls. And that first thing is it's important to share wide ranging stories. So in this particular instance, we're, looking, we're focusing on Emma Taniuka, who was an activist um, in San Antonio, Texas, um, and was known for the Pecan Sheller strike um, in the early 20th century. Um, and so there are Lots of other women like Dolores Huerta um, and other folks that sort of really fit um, this sort of theme of activism, but we want to make sure that we're not just looking at activists, we're looking at all the different contributions that Latinx women have made in science and art, um, the military, everything. So that's one of the things that they wanted us to make sure that we were doing. And two, they also wanted us to make sure that we were aware of the gaps in our collective knowledge. So one of the great things about the museum working at now is that there are actually opportunities for us to think very conscientiously about what is in the collection and what stories need to be added. Um, and the ways in which UDL actually can help us think about responding to those gaps, which I will pose to you all later. Next slide, please. So, 
one of the ways we can incorporate UDL is by utilizing our faves Project Zero thinking routines to do visual analysis. So if you were working on a project showcasing Latinx women in history and wanted to feature Emma Tanayuka, well, the Smithsonian American Art Museum has this amazing poster for you to use. One of the reasons why I chose this particular um, thinking routine, see, wonder, connect, times two, is that the questions in it actually embody some of the things that Tess was talking about earlier, access, building, and internalize. So I want you to think about those three words as Tess, Philippa, and I are modeling this particular activity. And please, as always, Follow along with us. I want to hear your thoughts as I pose these questions. Um, I want to know how you're feeling. I want to know what your observations are. So please, please hop in. But See Wonder Connect is a routine for looking closely and making connections to deeper understanding. So it's about understanding how to do visual analysis while making personal connections between yourself and the object that you're looking at. So let's hop in. All right. So First question is, of course, look closely. So look at the object. As my former colleague, Brianna White says, look up and down, round and round, side to side. Um, take a look at everything in this particular object. The use of wording, the pose of the woman in the middle, um, the use of lines and shapes. So, as people in this session are sort of thinking and, and hopefully sharing their observations, Tess, what is the first thing that you notice when you look at this object? I notice the bright orange mm -hmm. in the middle of the poster. It really draws, I think, my eye to the subject of the portrait. Philippa, what do you notice? I notice her expression. Mm -hmm. I when I see it, I just feel like she's she's deep in thought. She has a plan. <laughs> she knows what she's doing. And I'm sort of eager to see what she's going to do. Yeah. I think one of the first things I noticed, if you wouldn't mind zooming in, the text. So on the top part of the poster, um, a catalyst for social change. And the fact that this poster was made for a meeting of the National Association of Chicano Social Scientists. And for me, that's really interesting, sort of thinking about the context of this object. And also, like, why is this in an art museum, right? This is a poster from a social science conference. Why is this poster at the Smithsonian, at an art museum of all places, too? So thank you all for your observations. I'm gonna move on to the next step. So we've thought about what we see. And now what questions do you have about this object? What are some things that you wonder about? Oh, it looks like someone in the chat box, thank you, Katie, has mentioned the typography. Um, it's very tight. Um, and it's actually, it is, it's a little hard to read, especially if you're looking at a smaller image. Uh, Tess, do you have any questions about this particular object? Yeah. Um, I wonder what the lines are behind, mm -hmm. uh, the subject of our portrait. Do they remind you of anything, Tess? They look a little bit like bars on a cell, perhaps? Maybe. Yes. Hmm. A great observation. Philippa, do you have any questions? Any wondering? I, I was wondering that too. I was drawn to the lines also and potentially also a window. Like, which mm, way is it okay. going to go? You know. And both of those things are actually really integral to learning about Emma Teneyuka's story. So, Emma Teneyuka led a strike in Texas um, for workers who felt that they were being underpaid um at a factory um and some of the people were actually arrested uh for uh striking against the company including emma tenayuka but i love the idea that for tess it sort of symbolized confinement but for philippa it also sort of symbolized um maybe not necessarily hope 
but like a vision, right? Someone sort of helping you lead to the light in a lot of ways. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing some uh, good uh, thoughts and uh, wonderings come through in the chat. Uh, Sherelle wonders why the subject is not facing forward and is mm. instead facing at an angle. So thinking about the choices made here. Uh, Helena Marie said the same about the lines behind the figure, also wondering why those lines are there. And Julia is also wondering, similar to should. Uh, Sherelle, what the individual is looking at. And also, hi, Heidi in the chat. It's good to see you. Thank you for <laughs> helping. Awesome. These are some great wonderings. Um, we're going to move forward to the, to the third question. So we've talked about the image. We've talked about what we've seen, what comes up as we're analyzing this particular image. But let's sort of bring it back, right? So the story of Emma Tanayuka was a leader, an activist, a young woman um, who was involved in a, a really important moment in Texas history and was fighting for the rights of others and fighting for equal pay um, amongst many other things. So how would an object like this connect to subjects that you teach in school? So how do you connect sort of some of the things you talked about, right? This young woman, maybe bars relating to prison. We know that this person is a catalyst for change because it is right up there on the poster. Um, is there, a, can you see yourself incorporating this particular object or connecting this object to something that you teach? I'm gonna give a huge spoiler alert. Um, and say that this particular image does connect to things that I personally teach. Um, one of the things uh, that we do at the Women's History Museum is we really try to think about the ways in which women have worked with others to create change. And so we think about less about sort of the individual and more about groups and how when people come together over a shared cause, change happens, right? Um, but I see a really interesting comment in the chat box. Um, I, and I love this idea, Jan, thinking about teaching her story in a Spanish language class. All right, Tess and Philippa, you're the pros. How would you connect this to stuff that the both of you teach? I, I see a lot of connections between it and other objects that I know were in the Smithsonian's collection talking about activists and change makers. So I think it would be really interesting to use this as a gateway into a larger discussion about, you know, labor activism, perhaps. Um, you know, I think something that's really interesting about this piece is that I uh, or about Emma Tanayuka is that she worked so early on in, you know, what I learned about labor activism in school, exactly. you know, 1938 is the, uh, the title for uh, this and dating her uh, work in the Texas pecan strike. Uh, so those are some ways that I might use it. I see Heidi has a comment here in the chat too. If we teach about how groups have worked together to create change, and how new immigrants had to work together to support each other. That's a great That's comment. A great idea. I think also from a lot of the women that I that I study and, and teach is also teaching leadership, right? Thinking about how to be an effective leader, um, how to communicate. I think, and some of the things we'll talk about a little bit later is, you know, with UDL, you don't want to just use one object or one resource, right? You want to use multiple resources. And what's great about Emma Tanayuka's story is that when you do use other resources, um, you just sort of see a fuller picture of this person and their leadership skills. All right. So we talked about how we connect it to the stuff that we think about in our classrooms. And then we're actually going to bring it even more internal. So the final question is, how could you, how could this particular object how would you use this object to connect to your own personal interests or hobbies? So at this point, you want to think about, okay, this is how I would use this to teach Spanish or to 
teach English language arts or like, so at this point, how would you be able to figure out ways to connect this particular story, this object to your own? All right, I have lots of ideas, but Philippa, do you have anything? <clears throat> You know, looking looking at this image reminds me a lot of my grandmother, and I think I would connect. I could see a connection with family stories and family histories, and learning about what our grandparents were doing at the you know at this time. Tess, I'm I'm thinking a lot about what Philippa just shared. Um, I think that's a really wonderful pathway to talk about, you know, the stories that exist in our own families. It also raises my personal curiosity of better understanding um, kind of the beginning of workers' rights, or not the beginning, but the continuation, the long history of labor rights in the U.S., um, I see some great comments coming in in the chat. Addy says, um, as a Latina, the image really connects to my heritage and story. Uh, Jan is uh, talking too about, you know, personal connections and also uh, classroom connections too and thinking about world language, teaching cultural content um, instead of the typical how to be a tourist content as Jan says. For me, I work with a lot of young people and I really love the fact that, I mean, she's like 23 maybe when this happens, she's very, very young. And so it just reminds me of how important it is to invest in young people because they are a lot of times catalysts for change, but also just how overwhelming um, and and difficult it may be. So, you know, really taking the time um, with the young people that I work with to make sure that they have the support uh, to both understand how to do the work um, but to not be overwhelmed <laughs> by it um, or to sort of think about, you know, their networks and their communities to sort of help them carry out their goals and objectives. So. 100%. I just want to raise up some of the additional comments that just came through in the chat. Sherelle says, I've learned that advocacy takes on many forms. For me, this would be a great way to talk about or talk about the different ways that people use their personal interests and stories to change awesome. communities. I love that. Yeah, thank you. And Kate says, my personal interest is in developing a curriculum for civics education. So I'd look for ways to relate her story to stories in my local community. I love that connection between local and national stories. Exactly. Exactly. Now, before I move on, um, I wanted to mention one last thing. So this particular activity um, is has incorpor it incorporates different parts of UDL. Um, but one way that you could really jazz it up is with this first question, right? So the first question asks for you to look closely, but what if it said, listen, instead of looking? So what's great about this activity is that you could really switch it up. So say that we had a recording of Emma Taniyuka's voice, or we had a recording of a um, like a news item from that particular period of someone talking about the event, you could still use the same activity even with an audio recording or if you had a speech that Emma has given, like a typed up speech um, or a diary or a newspaper article. What's great with UDL is that in this particular thinking routine is that you could really do the same person at once with three different modes. So with listen, right, audio recordings or films or something, you could change that first word from look to read, right, reading newspapers. Um, and so it's really, really fun to be able to think about the different modes that you can incorporate to be able to get a more sort of comprehensive look into Emma Teneyuka's life. And if you need help with the reading portion, Tess and I did a session on critical reading last year. So if you need help figuring out how to do that, we have a session for you. Um, but what's great about that too, is that when you're using different modes of engagement, that really is feeding into the core components of UDL. So, and thank you all so much for your astute comments. Um, I enjoyed hearing and listening to them all. So in reading, excuse me, next slide, please. 
So with that, oh, actually, not with that. Excuse me, Ashley. Uh, I'll I hand it to you. I was like, oh, I'm free. <laughs> <I> forgot. <laughs> I'm on the hook? Not this time. Um, and also, I just wanted to to highlight some of um, the comments that were left because they're so good. They're so you all are like on it today. Um, but you know, Scott. Uh, talking about the importance of preserving cultural resources and then making connections between how culture evolves and changes over time and our approach to understanding culture today, spot on, right? Thinking about how Emma Tenayuka and the people she worked with, how they approached social justice and civic engagement and sort of thinking about the ways in which we think about these same things today and sort of making parallels and sort of observing the differences and similarities and how things have changed over time. Um, excellent use of resources in UDL. Um, and then Heidi, you are, we're like this, Heidi, like we're, we're like this right now, right? So Heidi says, I'd love to know about how women in different work environments are supporting each other now and ask my middle schoolers to do some research, like Heidi, like, love you. Um, yes, right? Thinking about women coming together in different environments in different stages of life from different places and supporting each other over an issue or a goal, right? Um, and thinking about that in the past and thinking about that in the present, I think would be a really interesting exercise. Um, and I think that the Emma Tenayuka, as you mentioned, Heidi, lends itself to having that conversation. Love you back, girl. Um, so sorry, with this slide, our process. So as Tess mentioned, we worked with the Access Office um, on developing this project, you wanted to figure out, is there a way to use women's history to teach UDL? And the first part of that is obviously barrier identification. So what are the barriers that exist in the Smithsonian collections, which prevent educators or really anybody from using our resources? Um, and what are the ways in which we can make that just a little bit easier? So thinking about captioning, thinking about alt text, I apologize. I thought it was uh, my my mic uh, that cut out there. While we wait for Ashley to come back, I can pick up the string. Uh, but thinking about, I believe Ashley was talking about the ways that we pull together resources online and can make them more digitally accessible. So thinking about alt text, um, thinking about to visually describing uh, the pieces that we're sharing um, and making sure to provide kind of multiple ways of interacting with the questions that we're sharing, whether it's via voice or via text in the chat. And then I think finally thinking about visual literacy emphasis, um, looking at ways to support learners in uh, building um, kind of internalized methods of engaging with uh, visual resources wherever they find them, whatever they are. So here we used um, this poster with uh, C Wonder Connect times two, which for those of you who use Project Zero, those questions are designed to become a part of the way that um, educators or um, students continually uh, approach objects in their life, whether it is within the classroom or outside, it becomes part of the way that they think about analyzing um, visual resources. So, you know, those questions are helpful in, you know, emphasizing, but also building um, the skills to analyze those types of objects. Um, I will, <laughs> I would love to hear what more Ashley would have uh, said on that topic if I didn't take over for her. So when she comes back, uh, I'll bring her back in. But um, with that, I think we'd love to move into the second part of this activity, um, coming off of everything that Ashley sh Ashley was sharing earlier about providing multiple means of representation. Um, we're going to take our observations into this activity where I'm going to play a short video and then I'm going to follow with another Project Zero thinking routine. So, Philippa, if you could play the video, please.
and I'm not sure I can hear it, uh, but that's okay because we've got Ashley, Ashley back. Um, so Philippa, would you mind restarting the video perhaps or restarting the screen share? Doesn't seem like the sound is coming through, which is really lovely in that it provides a narrated um, voiceover for the text. Okay, this should work now. I had to know what I did. Okay, here goes. 1938. San Antonio, Texas was home to about 400 pecan shelling plants. Here, a workforce of mainly Mexican and Mexican-American women endured dangerous conditions for as little as $1 a week on average. On January 31st, when owners of a major processing plant tried to cut wages even further, the workers said enough. 12,000 employees walked out on their jobs. They elected 21-year-old Emma Tanayuka, already a labor activism veteran, to lead their efforts. Tanayuka organized pickets, distributed flyers, and set up soup kitchens for the workers on strike. But the powerful plant owners used police forces to attack the workers. For three months, strikers endured tear gas and billy clubs. police arrested more than 1,000 workers. Eventually, the strikers prevailed. A deal was struck to pay the pecan shellers a minimum wage. Tenayuka said, I never thought in terms of fear. I thought in terms of justice. Emma Tenayuka and the pecan shellers became a symbol for workers' rights across the country. They showed the power of standing up together. Thank you, Philippa. So moving into this next Project Zero Thinking Routine, which may be familiar to those of you who have used it before, the routine is called the Headlines, and it consists of two questions that I'm going to ask one at a time. First, I'd like to ask you to write a headline that captures the most important aspect of this topic or issue. And in this case, we're thinking about Emma Tanayuka. There are many different ways that you could approach this. If you want to write the most important aspect of, you know, who Emma Tenayuka is or these um, things that we've been talking about, about labor activism, whatever, whatever strikes you, take a moment to write a headline that captures the most important aspect of it and please share it in the chat. I'll give you um, a couple moments to think and write. And as you think and write, Ashley, I'd love to hear what you think. Um, do you have a headline uh, that captures the most important aspect of this for you? And uh, for some reason, this is very inappropriate, but the Journey song is like in my <laughs> don't stop believing, you know, because it's kind of what it was, mm. you know, like, yeah. like, like they there were so many things that tried to hold them back and they just kept going you know um and that's what it's about like not being easily deterred i think that's a perfect headline uh, for those of you who haven't used this routine before sometimes if students are having trouble you can prompt them in thinking about and as a newspaper headline something catchy something sweet that wraps it up in five words don't stop believing <laughs> seems like a perfect thing for this uh, Philippa, how about you? Do you have a headline that strikes you? I, I was coming from a similar place as Ashley with She Persisted. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. 
So for those of you who are still thinking, perhaps writing your headlines down, and you can also hold them for yourself too, I'd like to pose another question. Um, this question is, if you could pull it up, Philippa, how does your headline differ from what you would have said yesterday? Mm. How has your thinking changed about this? Whether it is Emma Tanayuka, labor activism, Latinx woman in history, something else. How does your headline differ from what you would have said yesterday? Now, as you think about that question, I'd like to highlight some of the headlines that are just coming through in the chat. Focused on justice, not fear. Taniuka takes on tyrants and triumphs. Young organizer prevails by persevering. A lot of really good alliteration here. I'm loving it. Uh, the passionate pecan sheller led a walkout for better work conditions and prevailed. Wonderful. And a woman fighting for rights 90 years ago and still today. Mm. These are all so powerful. And I see a lot of themes here, uh, connected themes, thinking about justice prevailing, perseverance, passion, a lot of P words, a lot of good <laughs> alliteration connecting too. These are really fantastic. So again, as you think about these headlines, these big uh, takeaways from what you learned today, I'd love to hear too, how does your headline differ from what you would have said yesterday or perhaps your, your understanding of this? And for Ashley and Philippa, I think this is an interesting question to ask both of you since we have uh, been working with Emma Tenayuka for a while. But I'd love to hear, you know, as you think about, uh, you know, your introduction to Emma Tenayuka, the way that you've been thinking about her, how has that changed your thinking about the different <laughs> realms that uh, she was involved in? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this in prep for the session and, you know, UDL doesn't necessarily say uh, maintaining positive vibes, right? But I, I try to to lead with a hopeful vibe because there, there are parts of Emma Tedeuka's story which unfortunately still happen today. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a part of me that, you know, the don't stop believing, right? Having faith keep going, um, meet your goal, um, people coming together. But then there's also a part of me that wants to acknowledge that the more things change, the more things stay the same. Um, yeah. So I think my headline might, if I were, if I were to create a new headline, it might sort of reflect some of these sort of warring ideas um, inside of me about that historical event and its impact. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thanks, Ashley. And I see Sherelle has a, a good comment in the chat. Yesterday, headline would have been, she did that. And Sherelle, I'd love to know uh, more about what you're thinking with that one. But for me, it makes me think about uh, my understanding of her was essentially non-existent before um, I was introduced to her for, through Ashley. And I feel very thankful that I've been exposed to that because um, I didn't recognize her name. I didn't know her history and um, the impact that she had on labor activism of Chicano rights, et cetera. And my understanding was so vague. And so that what, what that is what your headline calls out for me, Sherelle, and my own understanding is just, she did something, I don't know what it is. And I, I think I'm better for understanding it now. Um, so as you keep thinking about either in the chat or personally how your headline differs from what you would have said yesterday, I wanted to pull back the curtain a little bit on our process and thinking about UDL guidelines and designing this part of our two-part activity. Um, I wanted to, you know, in designing this and talking together with Philip and Ashley, provide multiple means of representation while building access to content. So I referenced the UDL checkpoints for uh, perception, uh, providing multiple means of representation. So uh, for that, video offered alternatives for all 
auditory information through captions and visuals and vice versa. Um, to help provide another means of representation and help internalize understanding, I reference the checkpoints for comprehension, which really focus on activating background knowledge, pulling from what we began to learn about Emma Tenayuka when we did the See Wonder Connect with her poster. And then finally, to engage learning uh, while internalizing self-empowerment, I reference the checkpoints for self-regulation, to bring in opportunities to develop uh, self-assessment and reflection through this routine, which really asks you to think, what's your big takeaway from today and how does it change from your understanding yesterday? Um, so with all of this, Ashley, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about ways to take action. Thank you, Tess, and thank you all for your patience. Um, one of the things that we talked about is um, the gaps, the possible gaps in the Smithsonian's collection in terms of really showcasing the diversity of stories of Latinx women and girls in America. Um, so one of the ways that you can do that, and Philippa, would you mind going to the next slide, please, is by actually helping us take action. So instead of you doing the work, we're asking you to be a part of this new museum's mission to tell a wide ranging view of the history of women and girls in America. So one of the things that we're doing right now is an actual storytelling campaign. We're asking young people, people of all ages, people from all over this country to essentially donate your story to the Smithsonian and help us have equitable, inclusive, content that really showcases the millions of stories of women that we have in this country. So please encourage your students, as long as they have the permission of their parents, because we're not trying to have that underage stuff and make sure they have their parents' permission. But if you are over 18, please add your story. We want to hear from you. We want you to be a part of this national conversation. So if you have time between now and the 15 years that it will take for the museum to come together, visit uh, womenshistory.si.edu slash story. So uh, we've gathered the link to this website and all of the resources and questions that we have shared with you today into a learning lab collection that is linked in the description of this video, wherever you're watching it, whether it be YouTube or Facebook. Um, so I'll screen share that real quick as a preview. Here in the collection, you'll find a high resolution version of the poster, the video, the link to that page Ashley was just talking about alongside a lot of other supplementary resources for you, the teacher, um, to bring into whatever learning experience makes the most sense for you. We have other uh, learning lab collections that focus on Emma Tenayuka, providing multiple means of representing her story um, and engaging students with it. Other places to find additional resources to explore women's history, Latinx history, Latinx women's history, a link to the UDL website from CAS where you can learn a lot more about the guidelines, find an interactive version that includes all of those checkpoints and suggestions that we referenced and mentioned during the session and the graphic organizer. And this is to where the recorded version of this webinar will live so you can return to it later alongside the other places that uh, Philippa mentioned. Um, with that, Philippa, I think I'm going to turn it back to you for the Q&A. Great. So um, this is the time uh, we'd love to take any questions you have and talk more about what we did today. Um, so please feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat. And I'll take this moment to say thank you so much to Ashley and to Tess. I know you've worked so hard for many, many years on this. And, you know, even though we go through it in just 45, 50 minutes, there's really so much work behind all of this. And so thank you both for being here and sharing with us today. Of course.
And um, if there aren't any questions mm -hmm. in the chat, I think <laughs> I personally have a question for our participants. Um, and this is something we talked a little bit about in advance, but I'm really curious, I think Ashley is too, how you might use these ideas in your own classroom. You know, are there places where talking about Latinx women's history, whether Emma Tenayuka or otherwise makes sense? Do you see ways that these uh, kinds of questions and ways of thinking about UDL might make sense and, you know, lowering barriers to learning in your own classroom? I think not only are we interested to hear uh, any ideas that you have, but I think it might be helpful for other participants as well. So if any of you have any ideas to share in the chat, love to hear it. And sometimes it just percolates for a little while before something shows up too. So the link to the video, thank you for your question, Jan. So in the description of this uh, session on YouTube, uh, which I can see is where you're watching it from, you'll find a link to the Learning Lab collection uh, that contains everything. Philippa also put a link in the chat. The video is the second resource here. If you hover over it, you'll see a little uh, movie <laughs> video camera. Um, that's where you'll find the video that I played alongside the questions that I asked as well. Cool. Glad you found it. And also, just to add, um, so that particular video is from our Women Changemakers You May Not Know series. And those videos are also in Spanish, have voice narrations, and are closed captioned. So for those of you who are thinking about using it, I think someone mentioned using it in their Spanish class. We actually have a Spanish language version of the video available. So. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Ashley, and I'll be sure to add a link to the Spanish version to the collection once the session is over. Thank you, Tess. Yeah. Um, I just want to raise up uh, Heidi's idea that uh, she shared in the chat kind of in response to that question that I put out there to all of you, Heidi says, as a learning specialist, I'm thinking about using this as an example for professional development with teachers so that folks can see how to take different materials at the Smithsonian Learning Lab and look at them from a UDL perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to hear that this feels like a helpful way to look at um, how to do that with digital resources. There's something I didn't mention previously that's also in the collection, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it. So part of the work that we did this summer um, at the National Education Summit also included creating uh, guiding questions for developing UDL-informed Smithsonian Learning Lab collections. And while this guideline document focuses specifically on how to incorporate UDL in the lab, it's also transferable to using UDL with other digital resources on the web. So this um, a PDF, which is downloadable here, includes questions to help you think about barriers that might exist in the way that you use color contrast on the web, um, think about making captions available, transcriptions available, image descriptions, and more, alongside concrete suggestions on how to actually fix, uh, address those barriers. So where can you learn more about color contrast? How do you write alt text for something? This uh, PDF is hopefully a really good resource for that. So again, that's located in the Learning Lab collection that's linked in the session description. It's here in the Universal Design for Learning section as this PDF. And I want to raise up Addie's comment here and thinking about uh, through how to use this in STEM lessons and maybe scientific history and implementation. That would be really interesting. And I think the, the wonderful part about these questions and Ashley and Philip, I'd love to know what you think too. They are just so transferable. They really focus on, you know, for See, Think, Wonder, it's uh, supporting visual literacy skills. How do you engage with any sort of visual piece though? Ashley, I loved what you said earlier about how would this look different if you asked, uh, what do you see or read? What do you hear? Thinking about different types of resources, whether text, audio, video, 
Um, and then headlines is really thinking about reflecting on knowledge learned. Um, so I think those questions could work really well within STEM. Yeah, and I think our friends over at the Smithsonian Science Education Center and the Environmental Research Center also have some really amazing resources um, to not to not just explain how to teach things, but how to integrate them to make it more personal, right? So thinking about if you are teaching something related to astronomy, thinking about with UDL, it's not just about you know, seeing images of things at NASA, or at, at um, excuse me, at our National Air and Space Museum, or incorporating objects in person. So I was thinking about us in space and our role in all of these things, and and identifying how these things make us feel, and identifying resources to help us sort of understand how small we are, um, but just how. But again, the big portion about UDL is including reflect, reflection. Excuse me, and including conversations and questions that get people to understand how it relates them personally, both in school, but also outside of school. So. Just looking over the, the wealth of ideas shared in the chat, thinking about uh, collaborations between art and humanities, so thinking about that transdisciplinary approach um, Kate, I absolutely agree with you. You have a comment here about designing online ma learning materials and thinking about accessibility a lot and it eventually feeling like second nature. I think that's definitely true. I think it can come across as something that is daunting in the beginning, but the more and more you think about it, the more you see it, the more, you know, you can internalize the ways of thinking about how do you address it? really appreciate you sharing that perspective. And I'm interested too in Heidi's comment about uh, thinking about how to embed thinking routines online into other digital platforms, you know, more automatically with better accessibility. I mean, I'm excited about all the ideas this is sparking. So I think as questions wrap up, Philippa, uh, I wonder if it's a good time to talk about what's coming next on the Cultivating Learning Agenda. Sure. Um, so our next program will be at the end of January, on Wednesday, January 24th. And our guest will be Ann Kasperi. <coughs> She's a long-term educator at the Smithsonian um, at, from the National Air and Space Museum. And she'll be talking about cultivating a STEM mindset in young learners. So please come back January 24th. We'd love to see you. And if you would like to reach out to us at any time, please please write to learninglab at si.edu. And thank you again to Ashley and Tess for a really rich session today. And thank you all for being here. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.